Good morning, and welcome to Sycamore Presbyterian Church, our online worship. I'm Marty Cates, I'm the associate pastor here, and I'm so glad you've joined us this morning. Don't really have that many announcements, other than it is the beginning of Missions Month, and so throughout the month, uh, you'll have opportunity to hear from many of our missionaries, either through video updates or by them uh, being here to, to preach uh, God's Word to us. Uh, but this morning, uh, you get me for the first time in about six months. So I hope that that doesn't encourage you to turn things off. But uh, instead, like me, you're excited uh, for this morning, the opportunity we have to worship God together. Uh, our call to worship this morning is taken from uh, the 67th Psalm. And so I'd ask this morning that you uh, stand as we are called to worship by God's word. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Amen. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come this morning to worship you, to praise you, to bring you honor and glory. We come this morning, O Christ the Son, to praise you and to glorify you, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord. We come this morning to worship you, O Holy Spirit, for the work that you have done in us, the work that you do through us. You're working to change us and mold us and grow us more and more into the likeness of Christ, our Savior. And so, God, we pray this morning that you would be among us as we worship, as you have promised to do in your word, that where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there. And so we pray expectantly this morning that you are here as we worship this morning. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's now sing our hymn of adoration across the lands.
come now to the time in our service where, after having sung of our God's glory, having sung our hymn of adoration, having sung His praises, we realize we must confess before this holy God our sin. And so you'll find in your bulletin this morning a corporate confession of sin. And so we will confess together corporately and then spend time silently confessing to the Lord privately as He lays on our hearts. And so let us confess our sins together. Heavenly Father, please forgive us for our failures to love. We confess that we have failed to love you or walk in your ways. We confess that we have been preoccupied with ourselves and have failed to love our neighbors. We confess that we are more concerned about the appearance of being right than we are about showing mercy to others. Please forgive our wayward hearts and empower us to love others as we have been loved. Let us now spend time confessing silently to the Lord as he has laid on our hearts. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you confessing our sins this morning, confessing to you that we have often failed to love as neighbors, that we have often failed to show mercy, to have compassion, to be inconvenienced by those in need of mercy of love, of grace. So we come confessing that this morning to you, asking that you would renew our minds, refresh our hearts, the good news of the gospel, that we might see the beauty of the cross and lay aside our own selfishness, our own pride, in order to seek the things of your kingdom, to be good neighbors to those you have called us to. And we thank you for the work of Christ Jesus on our behalf that has secured for us your forgiveness and our salvation. And we pray this morning as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those this morning who have placed their faith in Christ Jesus, who are resting in the work of Christ on their behalf, We confess our sins to God because we have a sure promise that He will forgive us all our sins through Jesus Christ. For God's Word says, I, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Thanks be to God for His full and free forgiveness in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. With that good news, let us stand and sing our hymn of praise. His mercy is more.
Let us now declare our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We come now to the time in our service where we would normally take the offering but we are not doing that. But we do still want to celebrate God's blessings to us. And this month, throughout Missions Month, we'll actually have a chance to hear how God has been using His tithe and our offerings uh, to further His kingdom uh, through uh, some updates from our missionaries. Greetings, Sycamore family. Hi, we're Tim and Therese Gallage. For those of you who are new to Sycamore, We've been members of Sycamore since the early 90s, but for the last nine years, we've been with Mission to the World in Cape Town, South Africa. We were last with you in person about a year and a half ago, but lots have changed in our world since then, hasn't it? Before we talk about what's new, we thought we would just take you back to why we're here in South Africa in the first place. I'm a theological educator, and I came to teach at a Bible Institute. But since there are so few people on this continent who can afford the time or the money to engage in formal theological education, what has become so critical on this continent is informal theological education. And that's a lot of what I'm doing now as well, working directly with township pastors in poor, uh, poor areas of Cape Town. What I've learned is that classroom teaching isn't enough. It's important and essential, but it's not enough to change somebody's worldview. So for the last four years, I have been involved in taking some men on a longer discipleship journey. And I've been doing this through a reading group. Now, over the course of these years, we've read many books and Bible, theology, various aspects of pastoral ministry, um, books on marriage and family. And let me tell you about one of these pastors who's been in this group with me. His name is Tembalani, and I'm gonna share my screen with you. And there's Tembalani. And he's been in my reading group since the start. And I have seen his relationship with Christ grow. I've seen him grow in his heart for pastoral ministry. And he's really been excited about what we're doing. And he's come to me and he's asked me if I will help him start a reading group with some young men that are connected with him through his local church. So there's actually about 12 of these young men who are reading books now and are growing and in one way, shape or form are getting primed for pastoral ministry. And we're praying that this would really take off in their life. Tres is going to tell you a little bit about what she's doing. Well, I don't have the academic credentials that Tim has, but I do share the same passion he has for teaching God's word and discipling believers. My heart's desire is to point people to Jesus and then help them mature in their faith. And it seems like every time, every year that we've been here in Cape Town, my, the opportunities to work with women and children has, has looked very different at different seasons. Sometimes it's been after school Bible clubs with children. Sometimes it's been one-on-one -on -one discipling a, a pastor's wife. Other times it's been small group Bible studies or book discussions. Occasionally it's even been to be a speaker at a women's conference. But a lot of my life in ministry is something that a lot of you do all the time. It's being a helper. I'm a helper to Tim in many different ways in his ministry. I also keep and care for our home, not only for ourselves and to lift the burden from Tim to have to do much of that, but it's also a base of hospitality. 
that we try to offer to the many people that God brings into our lives. Um, also, there's just the other things that come up in life. Things like last year being asked to plan for the many details of a MTW vision trip to Cape Town. And then later, Tim and I both served as logistic coordinators for this big All Africa conference that was held last November. That conference was a very strategic time in terms of introducing some new initiatives that MTW Africa is going to be doing. And Tim will tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. 2020, I had expected to be helping in uh, planning a lot of conferences and also traveling with Tim as we went to visit our other MTW Africa missionaries on different fields. But as you well know, the coronavirus changed all that. So since March, Zoom and WhatsApp have been the major tools that we have been using to stay in contact with our, mis our ministry partners and for Tim conducting his teaching, having conferences, all kinds of things. Well, about a year ago, I was asked to be regional director for Southern Africa for Mission to the World. And I've continued to do lots of my teaching and, and mentoring, but I've added some additional responsibilities as well. In Southern Africa, there are about 10 countries and Mission to the World is in three of them, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. And one of the things that I have been tasked with doing is developing a 10-year plan for the region. So there's some things that we're especially focused on for the future. We want to help drive a reformed covenantal Presbyterian church planting movement. Good, solid, reformed Presbyterian churches are really hard to find in our region. And we're hoping to develop partnerships to change this. We're looking for Africans who will own our theology and whom we can come along beside and help them plant churches. Now, these Presbyterian churches that will get planted, they'll need to be part of strong presbyteries. So we will also want to help build a network of presbyteries. We've already had some pockets of Presbyterians who have asked us to come along and help them with this, and that's what we're doing at this point. Another focus we'll have is church health and church development. Now, there are scores of churches on this continent that are struggling, and they're struggling for any one of a number of reasons. Uh, they can be struggling because they're just insufficiently grounded in the word, or they can be struggling because they're just not properly structured. And there's a whole host of reasons in between. But we want to come alongside some of these churches and help. And we have a missionary colleague who's developed a process where we can help churches deal with some of these issues. Now there's going to be some other ministries that are needed to develop these initiatives and see them through. Ministries like campus ministry and children and youth ministry and other ministries as well. And we expect to be involved in those types of ministries in the future as well. So there's, there's lots to be done. And we can't do any of this without our great God's help and without good partnerships from our American churches. So one of the things we've done to try to facilitate these partnerships is through the creation of a new board within Mission to the World. And we're calling it the Southern Africa Reform Mission. Now this is a board of 13 people and included in that 13, we have four missions pastors and missions directors from large PCA churches. And I'm the chairman. A couple weeks ago, we had our first board meeting. Three church planning projects were presented to the board. And these are churches that are being planted by African nationals, not by Western missionaries. And our goal is to raise $100,000 to help get these churches established. And that's what our board is going to help us do. So these are some of the things that have occupied our time. But the task is too big. We can't do any of this without your help, without your prayers. And so we thank you for your involvement with us. Well, there's a massive transition ahead for you as Harry and Mary leave. They've been 
so special to us too. We've had a wonderful 30 year relationship with the Longs that we hope will continue. Harry and Mary, we want to thank you for your ministry over these many years to Sycamore and to us. We have experienced firsthand your love and care for us in many seasons of life, including up to the present, even as you called to see how we're doing. We so appreciate that. And you have modeled for us what true servant leadership is like, what it looks like, how to love and care for the church through thick and thin, you have modeled that for us. And we so appreciate that gift to us. We have reflected on it many times. Your example has served us well. So thank you for that. And now as you pass the baton to the next generation of leadership at Sycamore, we will certainly be praying for a smooth transition, but we're also praying for you, both of you as you enter this new stage in your own lives. We know the Lord has many plans and will use you in the lives of many in the future as well. Know that we would love to be with you at your party in September, but of course that'll be impossible to be there in person, but we will be with you in spirit. Thank you so much for your ministry. We love you and we miss you. Thank you all. God bless. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Greetings, Sycamore Presbyterian Church. Hello, we, Sycamore. <laughs> we miss y'all. Um, we want to thank you uh, for your support and, and prayers uh, for us over these uh, many years. It's been nine years almost. In August, it'll be nine years. And uh, so we want to thank you for your support of us. It means a, a lot. We have some great news to share with you on a n numerous fronts. First, our German core group has gelled. We have prayed that for years that we would be able to start a, a German church and we have a we have a, a core group that is uh, that has come together they're on the same page missionally they're on the same page theologically and uh, they're mobilized for for service and they're raring to go also this time of the coronavirus has been um, a mixed blessing for us one of the good things that has happened is that it's helped uh, us to, uh, to identify um, stable and reliable leadership from the American side. Uh, we, we, there was no other way we could do things. We just had to lean on people, and it's, it, people have stepped up. And praise God that he's provided some really great um, leaders and assistants uh, to just do the work of, of ministry. This has been um, important for us now that we are moving into a new building. We are moving from our rental space in Rambach, and that rental space we only had for three hours a week, and we were limited in that um, in a number of ways. But one of the ways that we were limited is that we did not we were prohibited from doing German language ministry. Now we're not, as we are moving into this new building that we are going to be renting full time. The building's in a in a really strategic location. It's not luxurious. Um, but it is really well located and um, it's a nice building and it will be very suitable for large group gatherings. We can see, I think, about from 130 to hopefully 150. I'm not quite sure yet. So we have enough room uh, to grow. We look to when the when the service, the, our worship service gets large enough, we'd like to to, to separate off a group to do the German language uh, service. Another quick uh, detail there are apartments above the building directly above and that's where we'll do our children's ministry if Sunday school also we have a uh, room for ministry interns that we currently have one French fellow who is single great guy uh, really interested in doing hospitality ministry and uh, also a good friend of his um, named Johannes who is uh, a German uh, fellow as you might imagine and he is uh, interested in doing, going into the ministry full time. Wonderful guy. He's got all the gifts for ministry. And he's a, just a, got a promising future as the Lord uh, grows him up. And uh, he looks to go to RTS Charlotte um, in 2021. And uh, we look to send him there. And his desire is to become a, a German pastor at our church. Um, so that's a huge answer to prayer. 
our family is doing well, and I want to give it to Nora to update you on our family. So, Anna, how old are you? Five. Five. Anna is five now, and um, she's our youngest, as you know. Uh, Paul is now 13. He's in seventh grade. He's doing well. Tommy is in fifth grade, and Johnny just turned nine and is in second grade, and his first day of school is actually today. They are enjoying the corona break, um, but are also missing their friends. But they're doing well, and um, yeah. Yep. Well, we have a few uh, prayer requests for you all. Um, our German core group uh, needs to continue to grow. Also, we're in the middle of a summer um, military transition time. A lot of people are changing station, and so they're, they're leaving, and we have other families that are be coming in. We need to gather families uh, to uh, our church, pray that the Lord would send families to us and that we would, um, we would be able to uh, minister to them, to the military, as we have been doing uh, for years now. Uh, also, we, you can pray for possible MTW missionaries to come to us. Uh, we're in talks with MTW now. Hopefully, we, the Lord would send uh, some to us for help. Uh, we can talk with MTW now about these things because we're right on the cusp of starting a German worship service. Also, retirees, people who are um, who desire to live in Europe for a couple of years, who are retired, who are mature, who have hearts for ministry, and who just want to help, uh, we're inviting them, and we have some people who might be interested in that, but uh, that's also an invitation um, to, to you and people who know, uh, you know, um, who might be interested in doing that type of ministry. Pray for Johannes for his year-long internship here and also his time at RTS Charlotte, Lord willing, in 2021 and for his upcoming marriage, maybe. Um, and that also that we would be faithful um, and that God would bless this ministry. Pray that we would be faithful day after day and that uh, the Lord would, he's got a hold of our hearts and, uh, and, and that makes all the difference that he has us. And, uh, and so pray that we would be faithful uh, to him, uh, to love one another as a family, and also uh, to to just be diligent for his church. Thank you for your prayers uh, for us and support. We love you all, and we hope to see you. We don't know when, but soon. Bye. Good morning. My name is Amish Ray. I'm one of the ruling elders of the church and I'm about to bring the prayers and petition of our congregation today. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord and Father, it is with joy and privilege that we come before you to offer these few requests for our congregation and ministries. You are a loving and all-powerful Father who delight in us and continuously fulfill our needs. Please grant these requests only if they bring glory to your name and further your kingdom on earth. Father, we lift up Marty Cates' father, C.L., and mother, Brenda. C.L. has Parkinson's and the related dementia, which has gotten significantly worse over the last few months. We pray for C.L. to be calmer, aware of the people around him, and easier to care for. We also pray for strength and patience for Brenda as she cares for C.L. Father, we pray for Barb Leary, who was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Please ask, we ask you for your wisdom, clarity, and peace as she arrives at a decision of whether to go mastectomy or to go with radiation and chemotherapy treatments. We thank you that she's surrounded by loved ones who provide her much needed encouragement at this juncture. We also pray for strength and rest for Rachel, Rich and Barb's daughter with whom they are staying as she juggles between the care for her little ones and meeting Barb's needs. We ask for your care and healing hands on Bill Angus, who had just underwent bone marrow transplant. We pray that you would sustain both Bill and Cindy in these days ahead of, as Bill undergoes additional treatments for his cancer. Father, we pray for Tori Cook as she adjusts to the painful recovery from the leg surgery. We pray that her pain can be controlled with just over-the-counter medication 
and that she will have a complete and quick recovery and that she would not get discouraged and would feel your love during this time. Father, we pray for the Sawyers as they prepare to move from Boston to Midlothian, that you would allow for a smooth transition with a quick and easy relocation and adjustment period for him and his family to this area. We also pray for our members as we prepare for this transition in the pastoral ministry. Father, as our lo locality, state, and country battle the spread of COVID-19 virus, we pray for protection from the virus for those within our congregation and our community. We request your intelligence, calm and guiding hands on the leaders in our local, state, and federal government as they combat the resurgence of this virus and how to compassionately deal with the protests in the communities around the country. We ask that you would clearly see your sovereign hand over all these events. As we are in the midst of the yearly missions month of our church, Father, we lift up all the missionaries and mission agencies that our church supports. Specifically, we pray for Phil and Nora Gelston in Germany and Tim and Therese Gallage serving in South Africa. We ask for your protective shield from the COVID-19 virus on both these dear families. We know that you have placed them in the right place Hence, we ask that you use them through their contacts and ministries to meet the needs of the folks around them. We also pray that you continue to offer them encouragement, strength, and guidance. Along with these, Father, we also pray for the numerous unspoken prayer requests for various needs of the members of our church family. We lift all these requests in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. This morning at our outdoor service, we, we will be installing um, and ordaining uh, those who do need to be ordained, uh, the, the officers of the church that were elected last week during our congregational meeting. You can see in our bulletin that we will be uh, installing uh, to the office of elder this morning, Chris Graham, Peter Martin, Trevor Roberts, and Jim Ulmer, all who have been previously ordained to the office of elder uh, but we now installed back into active uh, duty on the session. And to the office of deacon, uh, we will have Bob Maddox and Chris Wells, who have previously served, installed. Harry Fowler and Patrick Whitaker will be ordained uh, and installed uh, as deacons. And these are men that, as a congregation, you have elected uh, to serve in these offices, offices that are to serve you, uh, to serve our church and to serve our community. And it's by the virtue of uh, their character as outlined in Scripture, that you have deemed them um, worthy uh, to be called to these offices. And uh, so we rejoice uh, with them and with our congregation that these men take up these offices, these holy offices, and for Patrick and for Harry, take up these vows of ordination this morning. We're going to uh, begin this morning Missions Month here at Sycamore. I, I, it was supposed to happen in June, and, and um, you know, I've made the joke so many times now I'm not going to make it again, but you know, we had this little thing called COVID-19 that happening, and so we had to postpone uh, Missions Month, and really Missions Month I think is going to be a lot of fun this year. Um, one, because it's kind of a, a who's who of either present Sycamore pastors or past Sycamore pastors. Uh, so for example, this morning, I, I haven't preached since January here at Sycamore, I've missed you all. Um, I, I hope you've missed me. Maybe you're, um, you know, turning off your, your computer screen now because it's, it's Marty, but I hope not. Um, I, I've missed being in the pulpit and bringing God's word. Uh, but we'll also have Ambrose Winfrey, our current um, assistant pastor of Hispanic Ministries, Leonard Liu, uh, former pastor here at Sycamore, and Frank Matthews uh, throughout this month. And so it's going to be a wonderful missions month. And during missions month, we'll also have um, some ministry moments where uh, many of the missionaries uh, that we support uh, here locally and around the world have sent in short, you know, five-minute videos uh, giving us an update on their ministry and um, how they're doing and how we can be praying and supporting them. And we'll be showing those uh, during this service, the recorded service, they'll be a part of the service. And for those that, that might switch back and forth with, between the outdoor service and our recorded so service, um, they'll be available online to watch, but we're not going to, obviously, we don't have a screen outside to watch them. So, uh, those of you that are still tuning in to our online service, they get to be a part of your service. You've already seen them this morning. Um, 
But as we begin Missions Month, I want to begin uh, with this passage from the Gospel of Luke. It's a passage that we're probably, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's because you've grown up around the church or you've heard it because it's used often as a, as a lesson on how we should treat others. And so if you're willing and able, uh, will you stand as we read God's Word together this morning from Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is God's word. It's without error in any part. It's given for our good and for his glory. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, would you bless us? Would you use your word this morning to cut us to convict us, to instruct us and encourage us, but ultimately to bring us to the cross of Christ. As we pray this morning, that your spirit be at work in your words, drawing us ever closer to you in faith and in love, in dependence, in the work of Christ on our behalf, in whose name we pray, amen. So like I said, this is a, a parable that we're, we're probably very familiar with. Uh, even um, those that, that have not been around the church much, you've probably heard of the Good Samaritan. And so I want to start this morning by really retelling this parable and helping us see how stark this would have been to the original audience. And so if you will with me, there was an old man. Uh, he was in a downtown one Friday evening and uh, he, he was come upon by some, some thugs, some robbers, some thieves. And they mugged him. And they robbed him and they stripped him of his clothes, or most of them. And they left him for dead on the sidewalk down in Scott's Edition. It just happened that that evening there was a, a local a PCA pastor from Sycamore Presbyterian Church named Marty Cates who was going to meet some friends at his favorite brewery, Ardent. And he happened by this man. And as he saw him and he began to approach him, he, he crossed the street and passed by on the other side to continue on to meet his friends. It wasn't that much later that, that a worship director named Mike Brakehall, coming down the street to, to go and meet his wife for dinner at lunch and supper, saw the man as well and crossed over to the other side of the street to pass by him and continue on to meet his wife. And then there was a third who came by Shaped head that had been, hair that had been dyed pink. Piercings in places you wonder why they got that pierced. Tattoos all over her arms. She's a lesbian wearing a shirt that said, I can't breathe. She's carrying a brick in one hand. She's just come from some protest downtown. And to top it all off, she's wearing a face mask for the University of Virginia. She sees this man who's half dead on the side of the road. And she stops. 
and she begins to care for him. And she, she wipes away the blood and she, she takes the man and helps him to his feet and, and takes him to her car and drives him down to VCU Medical. She takes him to the emergency room and, and she gives them her credit card and says, take care of him. And whatever it costs, because he doesn't have insurance, I will cover. And then she's on her way with the promise that she'll return to check on him and to settle any of the charges that might come from the hospital. That's how stark this would have been for that original audience. You know, we, we lose it when we hear Samaritans and Jews because we aren't Samaritans and Jews. But for the Jews, they would have been thinking that this was going to go something like this. Well, there was a priest and and he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And there was a, a Levite, and he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And they were expecting Jesus to then say, but there was an Israelite. And look how good this Israelite was. And instead he said, and then there was a Samaritan. Their arch enemies, their rivals, hatred between these two groups. And this passage is, is a passage about being on mission. We, we see that at the very end, that, that Christ says, go and do sends on mission. So as we begin to, to think about Missions Month, this is a mission of neighborly love. What does it mean to be a neighbor? What does it mean to be on mission as one? I think this, this passage gives us four important steps to see. So that maybe we begin to see this parable not just as a nice parable we learned in vacation Bible school or grade school, but but of the parable that's teaching us even now what it means to be on mission for God, to show neighborly love. The first of these four steps is that it's an action. In verses 25 to 28, you, you see that it's in action. The mission of neighborly love is in action. It's not just a religious discussion. It starts that way, right? I mean, if, if we didn't know much about the religious landscape of uh, Jesus' time, we could hear this and think this lawyer is just a really good Presbyterian, right? He, he's asking great questions. He wants to get down to the theological correctness of what is meant by love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and, with, and love your neighbor as yourself. He, he wants to make sure that his doctrine is sound, and Jesus is supposed to be uh, somebody who, who's knowledgeable in these things, so he thinks, let's have the discussion. Let's get this all figured out neat and tidy so we can go then and make sure that we're doing things correctly and well. We do this. Right? We're, we're, we're living in a time right now, even in our own city, of, of protest and, and debate and argument and, and violence and, and, and riots and looting. And, and while those other things have begun to die off, the protests remain around our country. And yet we, we as as Presbyterians, as suburbanites, argue and, and, and try to make sure that we're, we're theologically and doctrinally correct in how we're approaching this. And so we have trouble talking about supporting Black Lives Matter because we don't want to be, be, be lumped in with capital B, capital L, capital M, even though we, we agree with lowercase b, lowercase l, lowercase m. We, we, we need to see that, that to be on mission for God and to be showing neighborly love is an action. It's not just a discussion, trying to figure out the correct way of saying things. So he asked Jesus this, this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that's a, that's a very typical question for his time period. Most of the religions of of Jesus' day were works-based religions. And so he's wondering, what's the things i got to do to get the eternal life? What do i got to do? Well, we, we do this. We want the checklist. Even this morning, as we're talking about neighborly love, you're hoping that I'm going to give you a list of, of four or five things. If you should go and do them, you'll have done the neighborly love. But here's the thing. It, while it, it is action, it's more than just a checklist. It's more than just a checklist. There's, there's two problems as Jesus is discussing this action with this lawyer that he exposes in this conversation. First is that that lawyer is just trying to find that thing that, 
that he can mark off to make himself positionally righteous enough to inherit eternal life. And, and he's wanting that list, just like we do. Give me the checklist. And so Jesus exposes in this in him as he's talking to him. And, and the second thing he exposes is this lawyer really wants to put a limit on who his neighbor is. That, that he really wants to limit who his neighbor is. The, the, the good Jews of the day would have recited this Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and, and your neighbor as yourself twice a day. The bad Jews may be once or none. But the good Jews, the devout Jews, twice a day they would have recited this. But, but Jewish Midrash law at the time said that, that your neighbor was other Israelites, others of, of your own socioeconomic class, that really it was people that were like you. And so this lawyer is wanting to confirm that He's wanting to confirm that, that he's been doing this already, really is what he's wanting to be confirmed in. That's why it says there before the parable even begins, after Jesus has said, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. And he says, what? Who is my neighbor in order to justify himself? Because in his mind, he's already doing this. And so he's looking for justification and, and, and Jesus blows this out of the water. He blows this understanding of, of neighbor out of the water. I know that this morning that there are people that, that, that the Spirit's already bringing to your mind names of, of individuals that God has put in your, in your life and on your heart for you to, to show them neighborly love, for you to be on mission for God to them, showing them the love of God, the mercy of God. And We've got to realize that our little definition of neighbor that we so want to see limited is going to be blown out of the water this morning. But before we move on, what we have to see that this is very, very clearly something that is done. Very clearly something that is done. And we see that because of how Jesus answers and even how the lawyer asks this question. What must I do? And Jesus says, do this and you will live. It is action. And, and it's always been this way. In, in that culture, in most cultures in the world, uh, and in history even today, to believe something is to have some actions tied to it. To believe something is to have actions tied to it. It's really only unique to American culture and Western culture in the last 50 to 100 years that you can believe something and there not be action tied to it. It's really odd. Most of the other cultures around the world look at us and think about how weird this is, that our belief isn't always tied to our actions. And our actions, we think, are often divorced from our belief. But what I think we'll realize is that that's just not true. So we need to be reminded of what it means to be on mission. mission. Showing this neighborly love to all people is not simply taking good sermon notes and discussing it over dinner or supper on Sunday with our families or covenant groups. No, what's supposed to happen is that we're to take the things that the Lord is teaching us and to put them into action. To go and to do. And so as we think about those people that God is calling us to and we want to see that, that narrowing of what it means as a neighbor because there's some people that are coming to our minds that maybe we don't really want to love. And so we're hoping that Jesus' answer of what is a neighbor the gates get closed down a little to be able to exclude some of those folks that we don't want to love. There's an action that comes out of this. That God calls us to a mission, not just to beliefs. We don't just feel that we have love for all people. We show we have love for all people by what we do, by how we act, how we move toward them with neighborly love. It's not just that it's an action it's that there's risk involved, right? You, you see this with uh, verses 31 and, and to 33 as we get to the priest. So the, the man has now been beaten and left half dead. And it says, now by chance, a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. 
There's risk involved. There's risk involved for, for all in this passage. And they're logical risks. They're not just like make-believe risks. They're logical risks. Right? The, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's about 17 miles. It moves from approximately like 2,500 feet above sea level to Jericho that's like you know, around 800 feet below sea level. So 17 miles, major elevation change over those 17 miles. If I was to put a picture up that showed the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, you would probably say to yourself, not a road I want to walk. Not a road I want to walk. And it, it was known to be dangerous, to, to, to be overrun with thieves and robbers, to those who, who would steal people off for the slave trade. It was not a, a good and, and nice place. And so there's the logical side of this for the priest and the Levite. Is they're, they're coming up on this man who's lying half dead, who's already been jumped, who's already been robbed, and they, they see him and, and they say, oh, the, the, the robbers, this is, this, is, this is a, they're setting me up. They're probably just laying down on the other side of the hill or whatever, and they're waiting for somebody like me to walk up so they can jump me too. And so what do they do? They walk over to the other side to cross safely by. So there's risk involved. Physical risk. Risk to their health and their livelihood. And for the, for the priest and the, the Levite, there's also the, the whole piece of the ritualistic ceremonial law that, that touching a dead body makes them unclean makes them impure, and they have to go through all these ceremonial cleansing and, and, and rituals that are costly and time-consuming, and they don't have time for that. And so for them, there's, the, there's this risk that they have to take into consideration, and, and the risk to them outweigh the mercy and the compassion that should be shown to this man. There's risk for us. There's risk for you and I. But our, our compassion has to override these risks. It's not going to be safe for you and I to show God's love, to, for, to show neighborly love to the people of our community and of our city all the time. In fact, for some of those people that, that have been put on your mind this morning by the Holy Spirit, there's going to be moments where you're going to have to risk things to pursue them with neighborly love. And, and it, it, it's going to be at times our safety. At times, it's going to be our safety. It's going to be our livelihood. It might be our health. We, we, we might be being called to, to pursue people with neighborly love, to be on mission for God for people who are sick and dying and contagious. And, and to enter in and to pursue them and to be on mission with them is going to put our own health at risk. It, it, it might, might be our reputation or our social status that's put at risk. And, and this is real and known. Our students, our children know this more than we do. Because at their schools, which they haven't had in a while, so maybe they've forgotten, but before all of this, at their schools, when they saw someone sitting in the lunchroom over there by themselves that was an outcast, that, that wasn't well-liked, and, and they made the conscious decision to show that, that person neighborly love, and they went and sat with them, they risked their own reputation. They risk their own social status to show love to a fellow student. It's not just in those moments that we would applaud them for showing love that they have risk. They have risk on the other side of the aisle too. When there are people in their lives that they've been called to show love to that maybe don't live as we would want our children's friends to live like. Maybe they have a friend who might be gay. Or might be trans. And, and, and they decide, you know what, I, I'm going to love that person. I'm, I'm going to pursue them with neighborly love. I, I'm going to befriend them and be for them and be with them in hopes that I might win them to know the love of Christ and the grace of God. And the risk that they have there is that they, they start talking about their friends and they get told, you can't hang out with those kind of people. You can't be with those kind of people. Why? Because we're afraid of what it might do to us. Or what it, what, what, it, what it might do to them, that they might be tempted and run off, away from the Lord, an apostasy. So 
So they have the, the risk on both sides, the, the extending the love to, to those who are the outcast and, and the, the unloved and, and the, the unpopular, and their reputation's at risk, but, but then showing their love on the other side. They're at risk of being judged by us. We, we have that same kind of risk as adults too, right? I mean, there are people that if we began to hang out with them and, and, and invite them into our social circles, that the rest of our social circles would stop inviting us around because they're shallow-minded, they're narrow-minded. And they, don't, they don't know or understand the grace of God, and so they don't see the beauty of showing neighborly love to those people. But we, we have to be willing to risk neighborly love to all people is going to take risk. Being on mission for God is going to mean we are taking risk. And we have this word with the Samaritan that I think is maybe the most beautiful word in the whole parable. When he saw him, he had compassion. And for those of us that have a relationship with Christ, that have been shown the mercy and the grace of God, we should see those in need. We should see those that are hurting and our hearts should be moved to compassion because the gospel is bigger than the risk. Because the grace of God overcomes our loss of reputation because the mercy and the compassion of our God overcomes a risk to our health and our safety. Neighborly love involves risk. It doesn't just involve risk, it's also inconvenient. Right? Verse, verse 34 after the Samaritan sees him and has compassion, he what? He, he stops. He, he, he goes to him. He, he bound up his wounds. He pours oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He had some reason he was headed to Jericho, the Samaritan did. He, he, he had business down there or, or some reason he was traveling. He had his own animal that he was riding at that time, a donkey or you know something. And what happens? His, his compassion moves him to stop and, and to, to bound up his wounds and, and to pour oil on them and, and, and wine on them to help keep them from infection to begin to heal as he bandages them. And then he takes this man and he puts him on his own animal. And he takes them to the inn. And in verse 35 it says, and the next day, so he stayed overnight how inconvenienced he was. And I think out of all of the, the things, this is the one that's the hardest for us. This is the one that's the hardest for us because we don't like to be inconvenienced. We, we, we don't like for someone to, to stop us and, 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 and say you know, uh, that they're going to take up our time when we're on our way to do something. Some of you have experienced this from me. You've seen me on a Sunday morning or at a church event and you could see, you know, probably the, the, the glint in my eyes that I've got something in my, my mind that I am, I am going to do, that I am on mission to go and complete some task or something, and you stop to say hello to me, and I've probably blown you off, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I read this, and it cuts my heart, because I don't like to be inconvenienced. Meredith can tell you more of the story, but I'll give you a brief part of it. We were students at Virginia Tech. It was our first year as members of the ACC conference. And we won the ACC football championship, which meant we got a trip to the Sugar Bowl to play Auburn. I organized a bunch of our friends to all go down together. Got a few hotel rooms, Told everybody we were going to meet in Blacksburg at this time. We were going to drive down to New Orleans. We are going to have a great time. We were going to see the Hokies play in the Sugar Bowl. They were going to hopefully win. But I had this one thing. I didn't want to make all these bathroom breaks. It's a 17-hour trip from Blacksburg to New Orleans. So in my mind, I thought, I'm going to make everyone take sodium pills. And then we won't need to stop to go to the bathroom very much because we'll all be dehydrated. It's a terrible idea, by the way. But to me, it made sense. Because I didn't want the inconvenience of having to stop all the time. It was a trip of like 30 or 40 people. It had a whole bunch of like young women on it, the college age, at the bladders the size of, you know, like a, a small water balloon. And I'm going, no, we, we, I don't want to stop all the time. I've got to hold it. 
at one particular stop, um, either because the guy in, in, in the car, one of the cars that was following didn't have a map to where we were going or what, I, my car was ready to go. I had yelled at them all to quickly go to the restroom and get back in the car, and so we're back in the car, and we're beginning to, to pull out of the parking lot, and, and one of my friends who's driving a minivan begins to pull out of the parking lot as well with um, the door still open, and um, a young woman who had not gotten into her seat and buckled herself in falls out of the car and tucks and rolls across the parking lot. She was fine. Not a big deal. Was a big deal. She was fine. Um, I felt horrible that, that that driver felt like he had to do that because of my impatience. We don't like to be inconvenienced. We don't. And yet here, what we see is that it is in the inconvenience that neighborly love is shown. You know, I, I don't like to be inconvenienced. I don't like to do things that are uncomfortable. But right now, we're being asked to wear masks in all kinds of places. And some of us just complain about wearing them and, and feel like we're making a point by not wearing them about our freedom or whatever it might be. But, but isn't it neighborly love to put a mask on, to show care for those who are really afraid, who are scared, who are vulnerable and high risk? We don't like to be inconvenienced. But, but the mission of God is one of inconvenience. It's also costly. It's costly. We see in verse 35 as it says that he, 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 the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Denarii. One of them is, is a day's wage. You know, the average salary in the United States is about $56,000 a year. And that means that roughly a day's wage, about $190, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. That was just off the top of my head. But he just takes out two days' wages, you know, $350, $400, and gives it to the innkeeper and says, here, and any more that, that you might spend, I will repay you. I will repay you. And, and this is something I think we, we, um, we look at and think a day's wage, oh, you know, he spent a lot on this person, but think about the, the equivalent today because they would have taken this man to the hospital and essentially said to the hospital, get him better. And whatever it costs, I will pay you. We know the cost of being in the hospital. It's not a couple days' wages. For somebody without insurance, it's thousands of dollars in care. Showing neighborly love, being on mission for God, is costly. But here's the thing. It's going to cost us our money, but I think that that's the easiest thing for us in all of this. We're scared of the risk. We don't want to be inconvenienced. And so if we can write a check, we will write a check. But it also costs us our time. You know, in his inconvenience, I said, you know, he stayed overnight. He, he, he didn't just stop and bandage and carry him on and leave him. He stayed the night. It cost him precious time on this trip. So wherever he was going, whatever he was doing, it's going to cost us time. The mission of God is going to cost us time. There are going to be things that we're going to have to say no to to leave margins in our life to be inconvenienced, to show neighborly love to one another, to our community. And, and, and those things aren't inherently sinful. It's just that if we sign up for them and we say yes to them, we're going to have no margins in life to slow down and show neighborly love. We'll have no margins in life to be on mission for God because we're so booked up. And so there might be things that we love to do, that we enjoy doing, that we have to say no to in order to be on mission for God. There'll be things that we have to give up 
to show neighborly love. It, it, it might even cost us things that, that we look to as heritage, as history, to show neighborly love. It, it, it might mean that, that while we don't see a statue as a symbol of hate, that we have to do the costly thing of giving them up out of neighborly love for those who have looked at them for a hundred years as symbols of hate, of dominance. Neighborly love is costly. It is not easy. As I read this parable, I think of one of my former students. His name was Reese. Reese was everything you want your son to be. He was everything that every high school girl wants to date and everything that every father of a high school girl wants their daughter to date. He was a Christian. He, his nickname at the football team was Rev. He was the captain of the football team. He was the prom king and the homecoming king. Um, he, was, he was awesome. And in this story I'm about to tell shows this. Reese was a senior. It was his final midwinter retreat for us, with us. And that meant that he was on a charter bus with a lot of his friends headed to Daytona Beach for a long weekend. And um, on the way there, about 30 minutes into the trip, I got on the microphone and said, you know, hey, we, we're working on rooming assignments. What I need you to do is take a piece of paper and write, you know, two or three names on the piece of paper of people you would like to room with and pass it to the front with your name on it. So I, I'm going to work on the rooming assignments now, so when we get there, I can tell you where you're going. After I had announced that, I'd been 10 minutes, a few pieces of paper had started to, to trickle up the aisle, and, and then here comes Reese, kind of just sauntering up the aisle, and he sits down next to me and says, Marty, I need you to do something for me. I was like, yeah, man, what, 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 what do you need? You know, I'm not stopping, but what do you need? And um, he said, I need you to put Jace, Trey, Darren, and Derek in my room. And um, I was like, well, I can't, I can't, I don't know if I can put four of them in, in your room. And it's like, I actually want shields too, so I want five of them in my room. And we had a few rooms that would ha had room for six people in it. And, and I was like, um, and he's like, look, just do what I'm telling you to do. Just put their names down next to mine. They're in my room. It's like, whoa, okay. See, and those five, five guys were, um, they weren't going to be on anybody else's piece of paper. There was nobody else on that bus that wanted to room with them. In fact, I had been thinking all week where I was going to put them in a room. I would wondered who I would make suffer for a weekend with them. And here was Reese on his last midwinter retreat with us. You know, the, the one you're supposed to make all those memories with and have the, the, the final goodbye with your buddies on. And what does he do? He gives it all up for the sake of those five young men who were below him. They were freshmen. What, what Reese did was action. He didn't just talk about how we need to love our younger brothers and sisters in our ministry. He did something about it. It was risky. He didn't know how his friends were going to react. He didn't even know how those freshman guys were going to react. It was inconvenient. He gave up all of those memories and opportunities with his buddies. And it was costly. His friends weren't happy. It didn't cost him friendships. But, but those evenings when cabin time came around and it was you in your room with a leader, it wasn't him and his best friends. It was him and five freshman dudes that nobody else wanted to spend time with. There's a, this picture of being on mission for God. But, but Reese was like that because he understood that somebody else had already been on mission for him. He, he understood that, that God saw the plight of humans, of us, in our sin, in our brokenness, alienated from him, and he acted. Jesus became man and dwelt among us, to walk among us, to know our suffering and our temptation how inconvenient it was, how much of a risk it was. 
And it defines costly. It defines costly. And he, he, he went to the cross to bear our sins, to lay down his life and sacrifice for us, to free us to do the same for our community, for our city, for each other. Did Jesus answer the lawyer's question? Who is my neighbor? No, he didn't. He didn't answer the man's question. Instead, as he ends, if you don't notice, he asked that man, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. So instead of answering this man's question, he says to the man, before you worry about who your neighbor is, you need to be a neighbor. Before you worry about who your neighbor is, you need to be a neighbor. And then he sends this man and he sends us on a mission. You've heard the story, Sycamore. So hear these words from Christ. When he says, you go and do likewise. Sycamore Presbyterian Church. Go and be a neighbor. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your call to go and be a neighbor. We thank you that Christ first showed us neighborly love, costly love, that he has invited us into his mission to go and do likewise. We pray this all in his name. Amen. This morning at our outdoor service, we will be administering uh, the Lord's Supper. And so while you, though, those that are watching uh, this online, uh, will not be here to partake, I want to take a moment at least and acknowledge this sacrament. Be reminded that it's a table set before us. It's a picture of neighborly love. It's a picture that's inviting us to come and eat to come and drink of the body and the blood of Christ Jesus, our Savior, who laid down his life for our sins. And we believe that by the power of the Spirit that, that grace is given to us at the table. It's imparted to us by the power of the Spirit that we, we are raised up to the heavens to dine on Christ, our Savior. And so this morning as we take it outside, at our service, I ask that those that are staying at home just take a moment and pray to thank God for the feast that awaits us and the table that is set before us, not just as a reminder, but as a sacrament where the grace of God is given to us for our encouragement, for our growth, for the strengthening of our faith. Now hear these good words. May the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.